the second son unexpectedly inherited billions of assets from his father. Before Eddie could even enjoy it, he started helping his prodigal brother, Frank, repay high-interest loans. On the day of repayment, the creditors humiliated Frank. Enraged, Frank unexpectedly killed the creditor. To save him, inevitably, Eddie also took a life. Just as one crisis subsided, another emerged. He learned that most of his father's income came from a grey industry, renting out 60,000 square meters of underground space on the estate to the Susie family for growing marijuana. Welcome to Auvo Movie Recaps channel. We hope you thoroughly enjoy our videos. Before diving in, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Determined to distance himself from the Susie family, he demanded they move out by the end of the year. However, it's easier said than done. While Susie superficially agreed, behind the scenes, they conspired with Bobby, her father who was in jail, to deal with him. And he spent years keeping on the manners. See if he fucks me about the end of the year, I'll chop his head off. Those who could partake in this feast were not ordinary people. Eddie had long witnessed Susie's tactics. When pressured, they were capable of anything. He pondered over finding a safe way to disentangle himself from them. Yet, someone dared to provoke them. First, Susie's exports to Belgium were seized by local authorities, causing them to halt exports and lose millions every day. Then, a distributor named Old D raised prices by 50%, insisting on no compromise. It was obvious someone was supporting him from behind to act so boldly. You don't take the fucking piss. As Susie was speaking, the power suddenly went out in the basement. He thought it was Old D's doing. Eddie hurried to investigate and found someone stealing their generator. They chased after them, and the butler, Jeff, intercepted the thief, only to realize they were just kids. Upon questioning, Eddie learned they were Roma people. Despite seeing their guns, they showed no fear, being a nomadic group of over 200 people. It turned out the local government had confiscated all their generators, so they stole two from Susie, following the principle of pick the soft persimmons. Seeing their plight, Eddie generously gave them one and dragged the other back to the estate. By the way, if you enjoy our movie recaps, we're currently hosting a giveaway for our audience. We're excited to announce that a brand new scooter awaits one lucky subscriber. Don't miss out. Subscribe and follow us to stay tuned for more updates. Susie couldn't accept Old D's price hike proposal and decided to let him cool off for a while. Eddie worried that the Roma people might discover their dealings while stealing, so he went personally to their camp to smooth things over. The Roma were united and surrounded them upon arrival. Paul, their leader, welcomed them and asked what they wanted. Eddie demanded assurance that their extended family would stay away from his estate. Is that because you're growing a bit of weed up there? He cut through Susie's excuses and handed him a bag of packaged marijuana dropped from their car when the children were stealing the generator the day before. They wanted a piece of the action. Negotiations ensued. And after both sides reached an agreement, Eddie decided to collaborate with them. With Old D breathing down their necks, and considering the Roma's extensive infiltration across various industries in Europe, they were an excellent distribution channel. They quickly reached a consensus. The Roma, being hospitable, arrived the next day with their convoy, and over 200 people celebrated tirelessly on Eddie's estate day and night. In a household like mine, where we can barely afford salt, entertaining guests isn't exactly feasible for those lacking both capital and composure. Yet, these guests, while indulging themselves, exhibited remarkably high work efficiency. Soon, the first batch of products was hidden within sculptures and transported through various channels to European countries. Eddie and his associates counted money until their hands cramped. This venture brought in a total profit of 36.66 million. But as fate would have it, trouble loomed. The next day, they discovered that the entire sum had been looted overnight. Eddie was the first to suspect the Romani people. Their previous theft of the generators predisposed him to this notion. He directly asked Paul if they had taken the money. Paul, with a kind smile, patted him on the back and left. The following day, 
Eddie found that they had all evacuated the estate. With the loss of their distribution channel, their export business faced another setback. Eddie, in deep thought, contemplated the situation. If Paul's people had indeed stolen the money, why would they not simply disappear? He realized he might have wronged Paul. Losing the European market, who stood to benefit from this? They turned to Old D once more. With a smile on his face and gentleness in his tone, Eddie informed Old D that he had accidentally dropped a drop of poison into his horse meat. If he didn't consume the antidote within five minutes, he'd have a meeting with the King of Hell. Under Eddie's benevolent care, Old D penned a name. After handing over the antidote, Eddie departed. Before reconciling scores with adversaries, Eddie sought out Paul to apologize, claiming he wanted to give Paul a gift. However, before accepting Eddie's gift, Paul sent one to him first. Eddie's gift to Paul turned out to be a man named Kiss. As instructed by Old D, they intended to kill Kiss. Before his demise, Kiss advised Eddie, warning him that Susie would eventually kill him. He recounted how a cashier was disposed of in the Thames River. The cashier was a witness to Frank's murder. Unable to bring himself to kill Kiss, Eddie provided him with a boat to escape. Through Kiss, Eddie learned that Susie had disposed of the cashier without his knowledge. After dealing with Kiss, Eddie hastened to detach himself from Susie. Thus, a new chapter in the story began. Meanwhile, Susie was taken aback to discover his brother Jack entering the dressing room with a beautiful woman. Despite being engaged in a project worth 137 million, Susie couldn't sit still, disturbed by the fact that the woman his brother brought in was the girlfriend of the boss they were negotiating with, Mr. Charchi. Susie hastily found an excuse and slipped away to the dressing room where he stumbled upon a scene the audience wouldn't appreciate. Jack, you better not be doing what I think you're doing. Just give us a couple of minutes, Sus. Are you taking the fucking piss? There's a time and a place. What's wrong with you? Sus! As the siblings conversed, Mr. Chachi barged in, recognizing his girlfriend's high heels. The cat was out of the bag. Angered, Mr. Chachi approached Jack and threw a punch, which lacked force. He quickly followed with a second punch, low in physical harm, but high in insult. This enraged the boxer Jack, who retaliated with a single punch, knocking Mr. Chachi to the ground. Meanwhile, in the woods, upon learning that Susie had killed the cashier behind his back, Eddie urgently sought to sever ties with Susie. Susie stated they needed to launder 137 million first to pay Eddie's rent before exiting. This process would take three months, which Eddie deemed too long. He requested Susie to arrange a meeting with Mr. Chachi, who handled money laundering. This disrupted Susie's plan with Mr. Chachi. Eddie then reached out to another money laundering expert, Henry, who used boxing matches for laundering. Susie had been avoiding associating boxing with drugs, but Eddie was undeterred. He just wanted to cut ties with Susie as soon as possible. Eddie demanded Henry to launder the 137 million within two weeks. Henry introduced Eddie to his partner, Rick, an accountant with OCD tendencies who was meticulous in laundering money. Charging only a 5% commission, Rick was the perfect fit for their needs. At the same time, Rick's obsessive compulsive disorder meant that if anyone doubted his falsified accounts, he would hound them until they completely broke down. On the other side, Susie used persuasive means to convince Mr. Chachi. Not only did Mr. Chachi agree to help launder money, but he also promised to do it for free, needing only two months. However, Susie told Eddie it would take four months. In reality, she had no intention of leaving Eddie's estate and deliberately delayed, dragging out the timeline. When Eddie came with the money to meet Mr. Chachi, the latter intentionally found fault, venting the frustration he endured from Susie onto Eddie, forcing Eddie to eat halal corn dogs he disliked. Furious, Eddie exploded at the servant. Bags in the fucking car. Yeah? Okay. Deciding to take matters into his own hands, Eddie took the money directly to Henry for laundering. Susie was displeased with Eddie's unilateral decision and confronted him, expressing her firm unwillingness to leave his estate and questioning him about the cashier's death. 
Susie claimed silencing the cashier was to protect Eddie, stating the cashier would inevitably become troublesome. When will you let me and my family go? Never. The two partners had a complete falling out. I can be nice and I can be not so nice. You've only seen me in one setting. Eddie sought out John for help in evicting Susie from his estate. They quickly negotiated terms, with Eddie only wanting to achieve his goal without harming the Susie family. You have my word, as a gentleman. On the day of Jack's boxing match, Frank, Eddie's brother, suddenly approached Susie. He harbored resentment towards Eddie for inheriting all of their father's assets and sought to exploit Susie to undermine Eddie. But Susie coldly rejected his offer. As the match began, Henry approached Susie directly, expressing his interest in Susie's 14 marijuana production sites with an annual profit of up to 22.9 billion. Anyone would be envious of such wealth. Henry threatened to take over all of them. You're a boxing promoter and a money launderer. You want to stay in your fucking lane. Henry's boldness was backed by his cunning. He set up a scenario where a boxer deliberately threw fights, winning only 3 out of 30 matches to lure Jack into a match against him. He then used Jack's life as leverage against Susie, forcing her to choose between his business and his brother. Confident in his brother, Susie made his choice. However, moments later, Jack was knocked out cold. Much to Eddie's surprise, whether Eddie can successfully reclaim his 137 million remains to be seen. Stay tuned for the next installment to find out.